I'm Natasha, and I'm Red. And together we are Syllogism, a science, culture, and philosophy challenge podcast on the edge of chaos. This season, we'll invite guests of varying expertise to playfully investigate Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences. Each episode will explore a particular type of intelligence according to Gardner. This week's challenge was to watch the 2019 Jordan Peterson and Slavoj Zizek debate on communism, capitalism, and happiness. To help us flex our existential intelligence, we brought in Matt McManus, who is a lecturer at the University of Michigan and the author and editor of several books, including The Emergence of Postmodernity and his forthcoming book, The Political Right and Inequality. Matt has also been a regular contributor to the Plastic Pills podcast and other outlets, and he's interviewed Noam Chomsky and Zizek himself. Enjoy. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all going to be, it's going to be on the phone. I got to figure out. Oh, this is fun. Put the darn thing. But yeah, at least I'm in. I have no idea what's going on because everything else is working fine except for my Chrome. Good. This is great. I'm so excited for this. Okay. So. So we were talking about the modern left and how I said, I think they're like a nation of haters. Matt, you were going to say something about it? Oh yeah. I, I was going to say, I mean, I definitely know the types that you're talking about and it's frustrating. I mean, every time I have a Jackman article that comes out arguing for something like liberal socialism, for example, or argues that, you know, there are religious genealogies that you can draw linking, you know, Christianity or Judaism to Marxism or socialism or what it happens to be. I just get like a ton of people who are like, you know, to the gulag with you. And I'm like, guys, you just, you all got to calm down and get a fucking a life. But, right. you know, honestly, I'd say that most people on the left are very amiable, usually very compassionate people. It's just kind of like what you were saying before. Those types aren't usually the ones that seek excess amounts of attention. So they're not usually the types that you'll come into contact with very frequently, right? Like I've known a lot of social workers, human rights workers, yes. who are the type of people who will sit there and distribute pencils to starving yes. children all you're day. You're hundred percent right. And you know what? You you know what? You find those people when you're actually doing shit. Because when yeah, I've done exactly. any kind of activism, IRL that's mm -hmm. that's what i find is like the good-hearted people because they're not out there fucking with their bullhorn being assholes yep so hey <laughs> hey brett <laughs> no i, I think you're exactly right well we're out here with our bullhorn being assholes in all directions we believe in you know equality here so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> equality. Yeah. since everyone has an asshole that is kind of the ultimate a symbol of equality so it's true <laughs> I mean, it's we, like my we, fucking 10th grade drama teacher said, you know, everybody poops from the Queen of England down to, you know, the, low, the humblest peasants. So, yes. great equalizer. So, join us in the waste of the proletariat. That's a yeah. lot better than what my aunt used to say. My aunt used to say, everybody, everybody puts their pants on the same way. And I always thought that's, not, that's objectively not true. So Yeah, that's not true, right? Yeah. Okay, so here we are, all three of us, finally. And I brought you on because um, this episode is talking about existential intelligence. And we thought we talked about guests for the show that could be like theologists or philosophers, priests, like anybody from like the effective altruism movement, um, people I know, um, different NGOs that are trying to work on existential things like existential crisis. But I thought let's do some culture war type shit because that's fun. And I feel like <laughs> it's, a, it's a great example of thinking that has the potential to be existential, but oftentimes sure. gets trapped in the ego. So the challenge was to watch the debate between Zizek, Slavoj Zizek, and uh, Peterson from 2019, which I basically brushed off as something I wouldn't want to watch. And I was surprised how much I actually enjoyed it. It was, it was yep. surprising. Put it on a good show. Oh, they did. I mean, funny story about that. My wife and I met in 2015 at a conference where Zizek was speaking. And one of our first conversations was about his book. And then oddly enough, we will watch that debate on our honeymoon several years later <laughs> at the same time. And, you know, in between getting cocktails and going to the beach, we were like, we need to right. fucking stay inside. It's too hot. Let's just watch this. So anyway, it's just kind of a recurring theme throughout our, our romantic history. I'm not sweet. sure what to say about the most romantic thing. thing you can do hey look you know you want to fucking sit there and just watch a kermit speaking canadian psychologist 
attacking us of Indian psychoanalyst, you know, we've got the perfect romantic thing for you. I thought, I thought the greatest, so, so Kermit and then listening to Slavoj sit there and, and try to figure out how to shut off some of his salivary glands and position his tongue correctly so that he can make a single utterance that made sense without having to be run through some kind of a filter. Yeah, between the two of them, it was a, a, a comedy of speech pathology. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, you can see why they both decided to go into psychoanalysis, at least once upon a time in their academic disciplines, right? They're like a bundle of pathologies and tics and weird idiosyncrasies, right? Characters, as my yeah, grandma yeah, used they, to say. Yeah, they both were characters, and it was interesting that at some point during the debate, it's something that Jordan Peterson actually says to Zizek is, you are a character. <laughs> yeah. But of course, every, 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 every analysis is some kind of a confession, so. so. I mean, I did not know this existed until last year, but there's apparently a rap video that had something like 500,000 views of a guy parodying Slava Zizek, and he's just talking about how you've got to chop off the balls of ideology, and it's over this, like, really euro oh rap beat. That's getting stuff. linked. That's getting linked right now. I, I, um, would do, I would do the beatbox for that. I'm actually pretty good at that sort of thing. And no, I can definitely not. work in a couple of, uh, you know, slurpy slurp fiddle sounds. That was the hardest part. And it's funny because my husband's watching it and he took a picture of all of their shoes on stage. And it was just so funny how, you know, I couldn't watch Zizek. Like every time he spoke, I had to look away because I'm like, it's just too, it's just too much to it's just too much to like my sensory overload was like, oh, yeah. oh you have fucking have autism or something. Cause like, I, I was just saying, say, are you doing an autism right now? Cause I think so. I, didn't I, think I yeah, I have the tism, winterary tism, but like it definitely, I think detracts from the message in a sense, or maybe it adds to it, like the physicality and the caricature that they are. Um, sure. And I think that kind of like strangely and paradoxically enough, kind of removed the self from the argument a little bit like them being face to face versus this like back and forth that happens like online between Taleb and you know fucking now Lex or whoever they're arguing with being face to face with someone and watching all of their tics and looking at their fucking stupid shoes I think grounded all of this in something higher and they were able to agree largely I know I'm yeah, what's unusual about that debate, as a lot of people pointed out, is it was kind of heralded as the joust of the century, right? Where you would have the world's premier Marxist or leftist thinker against, you know, Mr. Reaction Boy over there. And instead, they wound up having a lot of nice things to say to each other about pretty much everything. And Marx and Marxism very, very rarely actually came up. Right. I mean, they ended up spending a lot more time talking about how Cupid has arrows and, you know, the different ways that you can understand Christian symbolism. And in some ways, I think that was more interesting. These kind of debate bro forums are a dime a dozen at this point. I mean, all you need to do is go onto YouTube. It was somewhat more constructive just to see them actually have a dialogue with one another about their differences and to draw out some meaningful points of intersection. On the other hand, I think that Zizek did do a good job of, this kind of speaks to what you were talking about earlier, Natasha, presenting... Definitely a guy who's a leftist and a character, but somebody who doesn't necessarily conform to a lot of the stereotypes you would associate with, say, social justice Marxism or postmodern neo-Marxism. You know, since he doesn't like <laughs> postmodernity, he's a critic of identity politics. He's definitely got some very politically incorrect kind of views about things. Interestingly enough, when I was going through the Twitter sphere the next day after that, there were even some Peterson fans who seemed to find his work intriguing. So I think he was pretty successful, at least in. Getting them maybe to pick up a copy of the sublime object of ideology. I think what he did was utterly brilliant because at some point when you're talking about, oh, I think it was Hegel has the, the quote that I think references in the talk itself about how, you know, it's, it's the gaze that sees evil everywhere that is actually the source of evil. And I'm paraphrasing mm -hmm. in a probably mediocre way, but I think what happened with Peterson was he was a legitimately one of the first more nuanced thinkers to come along in quite a while to contend with some of the bullshitty activist and reactionary stuff coming out of the left that, that really mm -hmm. kind of started overtaking the culture. But his initial approach was exactly what you would expect it not to be. When he's talking about listening to others and they might be able to teach you things, he walked in with an ideology that he also rails against and simply parroted talking points that could be directly out of the most rudimentary capitalistic uh, textbook 
and ultimately mm-hmm. wind up describing a lot of things that you could get easily in uh, another bullshitty MBA. And, and while those things are relevant, he really walked in thinking he was opposing someone that was like an avatar of a straw man he that did. you normally see in college debates where it's like tweens just learn their first five thoughts and they're going to sling them around. And, and Zizek was not that person. And what he was most adroit at doing was just demonstrating how to have a proper dialectical conversation. And he wove that in in such a way that Peterson wound up having to meet him at his level and have a real discussion, which is not what you normally see anywhere in any of these, like you're saying, these bro debates where it's just smashing people. Because that's kind of bullshitty and, and, and trite and boring. And I really thought that was what was going to be. But I thought that both. because of the way Peterson opened and he opened like a baby. An asshole. Yeah, he was an asshole. And, and Zizek bitch slapped him with adulthood. With love. <laughs> and kindness and Cupid's arrows. Yeah, yeah. C- Cupid's arrow right in his glow. <laughs> yeah, which is unusual too, because I mean, even the opening salvo, I mean, to be fair to Peterson, this was right before he went through his difficult period. And yeah. you could kind of already see that right when that was happening because he looked considerably more tired and seemed a bit more disjointed than he normally is. Because whatever you want to say about the guy, he's usually very articulate and at least polished in a certain way, right? It, even if when you try to unpack the content of what he's saying, it doesn't always make the most sense. Let's just put it that way, right? But, you know, even that opening conversation where he was like, you know, I haven't actually read anything by Marx in... 30 years. So I decided to go and back and dust off my copy of the Communist Manifesto and run through it a little bit. That to me was kind of a shocking admission because I had read most of what he had written before and I was aware that he had never written that much critical of Marxism. But because he talked such a big game about postmodern neo-Marxism and gulags and Solzhenitsyn and all that stuff, I was assuming he would have at least been familiar with some of the more academic dimensions of Marxist analysis, which isn't to say, you know, I agree with a lot of Marxism. Let's just put it that way, right? Uh, but the fact that you have, you know, the most world's most prominent critic of postmodern neo-Marxism saying that all he's ever really done is read the Communist Manifesto twice over a 30-year period, and that's about a 20-page pamphlet that was deliberately intended to be a kind of simplification written when the authors were, I think, 25, 26, very young. No, 29, sorry. I mean, That was genuinely shocking. And another kind of moment that really struck home for me that I was less surprised by was when Zizek, like you said, just asked him, you know, tell me who these postmodern neo-Marxists are. (laughs) Name a few of them for me. And he was like, couldn't even do that. Now, there was a sequel to this a couple of years ago. I guess it was 2021 where he listed off a bunch of the people that he considered to be postmodern neo-Marxists. And it kind of became a meme for a little while because it was also really bad, right? Not only did he list some people twice, I think Foucault appeared in there twice, but some of the figures that he put forward, like Catherine McKinnon, for example, she's famous as a kind of structuralist feminist, but one of her most infamous articles is Points Against Postmodernism, where she basically runs through why she thinks postmodernism, postmodern theory has been just a terrible thing for feminism and that any legitimate feminist should run as far away from it as she possibly, or he possibly can, right? So even his effort to kind of try to add a little bit of nuance and specificity to that claim just completely fell flat, which... You know, is- the, the thing about this debate that, that really got me, like for the first time ever in watching this debate, when I saw him have to respond, I realized, oh shit, perhaps putting all my ideas and thoughts out there is quite dangerous because... <laughs> yeah. This is the first time it really like occurred to me that if you are dishonest, people will find out. And if you are honest, people will suspect you of dishonesty or stupidity. So like Peterson was being honest in that opening argument saying, I haven't read this shit, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, and then and then you're right. He went through that horrible crash. But I think to Peterson's credit and the reason why I'm a little less scared is because he is good at extemporaneous thought and he can kind of rescue that and so i think his initial mm-hmm. loss the l he took kind of in the opening statements he recuperated because at the end oh, he yeah. said the takeaway should be that you can have conversations with people you disagree with and then mm-hmm. Zach said the takeaway should be we shouldn't have this like false dichotomy like please know that there's a lot more shades of gray than the than just this black of white you're saying you're surprised that peterson hasn't read Marx. i'm not because mm-hmm. There's two ways you can do philosophy. You can do this kind of like gloss over listening to other people's interpretation of whoever, right? You can read a million different analyses of the difficult thinkers, you know, Hegel and Heidegger and 
you can kind of like learn about them that way. Or you can study those thinkers deeply and build upon them. But nobody studies a thinker deeply unless they want to build upon them. Oh, yeah. You are a different animal, which is why it's cool that you are coming on for this conversation because you study the thinkers that you disagree with. Yeah, and actually, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. But one of the things that's kind of disappointing to me about Peterson, and I'm not sure if this is audience capture or just his illness was more severe than people thought it was, is when he initially kind of rocketed to fame around 2016, 2017, 2016 in Canada, I'd say, I kind of got interested in what he was saying because I have my own critiques of identity politics, and I also know the type of people that he's talking about when he's critical of some of these social justice activists. You know, I went to York University. They're not foreign to me. And so I decided to kind of read Maps of Meaning and also 12 Rules of Life when it came out. I have problems with Maps of Meaning like everybody in the world does. I certainly don't think it's nearly as apocalyptic work as Peterson clearly thought it was. I mean, it opens with a quote from the Bible saying, you know, I will utter truths that have since been, um, thus far have been hidden from the foundations of the earth, right? Nobody kind of appeals to the Bible in that way unless they've got a bit of an ego. But it was a good, solid kind of psychoanalytic take on mythology perception and a number of different other topics. And I was like, okay, so he's going to be a serious conservative intellectual. That's always an intriguing thing because a lot of what you find coming from the right is kind of polemicist rather than serious intellectuals. And actually that was one of the reasons we decided to produce our book, Myth and Mayhem, a leftist critique of Jordan Peterson that I co-authored with a bunch of other people, including Zizek. He wrote the introduction to it. And, you know, we decided to take his work seriously, go through it, you know, page by page, line by line, acknowledge what we thought he got right, and then deconstruct or criticize what we thought he got wrong. And it's been a little disappointing to see since then that he seems to be pandering to the worst parts of his audience or really not engaging mm -hmm. in the same kind of nuanced discussions that you did see, as you pointed out, at the end of that debate with Zizek. Uh, now, every now and then, you will see that Peterson again. Like, I saw him give an interview with... It was a libertarian podcast of some sort, I can't quite remember it, where he was talking about Michel Foucault, and he said something like, I like the first two-thirds of The Order of Things, it's a very interesting, good book, kind of goes off the rails at the end. I thought, you know, I actually feel the same way, so that's interesting, you know. I haven't seen that side to you in a long time. But then nothing came from that, they moved on to a different conversation, and he started railing against environmentalists and ecology and all the normal stuff, and I was like, okay. But yeah, I was like, we're back to this, this guy. He, like so many others who are capable of better thought, need to do things like stay away from the social media platforms. Yeah. Uh, every time he tweets something that uh, you might say almost could be like if you were looking at a Nietzschean aphorism and you would sit there and, <laughs> and then start to expand uh, this thing that has a, a kernel of truth, you can do uh, that with something that he writes and you can do sure. it in a very poor way. And it does, in fact, pander to those kinds of... Uh, reactionary people. And I, I think that it, it's appalling how bad that platform is. I think he knows it just like everyone else does. And I think Sam Harris also recently got off. A lot of other people won't spend time on there at all. I refuse to even have an account because it makes you, I, I think, almost like functionally retarded. Like you cannot express yourself in a nuanced way without a thread that's, you know, 30, 30, I guess, tweets long, let's say. And even then, you're likely to be doing something that is ultimately reactionary and the things you're going to say are not going to be the best quality of your thinking. He does cool stuff. Like he still interviews and discusses things at very high levels with, you know, an extraordinary range of intellectuals that wind mm -hmm. up getting hidden by the reactionary garbage that, that is drawing so many people in the wrong direction. Something that he would never have wanted, I think, maybe before all the bad things happened to him. And yeah, if I could just interject and say, People often ask me, since I've written a lot about him, nothing really substantial for a long time because I pretty much said my piece. But, you know, once upon a time I was asked, you know, what do you agree with him about? And actually what I was most interested in when it came to his work had nothing to do with politics, but it was actually his account of perception and epistemology. Uh, now, again, I have technical issues with some of what he said. But, you know, it was interesting that there was a lot of overlap there between our kind of epistemological viewpoints. And he's capable of having very sophisticated conversations about issues like that. And I've seen that sometimes in some of the discussions i will have with people like Roger Penrose, for example. It's just a shame, again, that that's not the thing he leans into at this point. Like you said, he seems well, to be yeah. a little more content with the, the simple, reductive approaches to things. I think the reason why, like, Peterson knows that he has to capture his audience. And so when I was first thinking about it, you know, when I said I think he's being honest in a sense in the beginning of the argument saying i haven't read 
marks, you know, really, mm-hmm. really well. And I think he has to be honest, but I also think he lies in order to accomplish his goal, which his goal is ultimately to take the most personal responsibility. And his belief is that if he takes personal responsibility, it will kind of like trickle out into the world and have collective action. So I think he grounds a lot of his choices and decisions in taking these actions. So when he's made this conscious choice, in my opinion, to pander and it was after his big breakdown, he kind of came out as part of the Daily Wire and he he chose this path. And I think it's because he wants to maximize his impact. And I think he knows that, or I think he assumes, I don't think he's correct, that he'll have the most impact with the right. But I think being a nuanced thinker, it takes a physical toll on you. And it also kind of destroys some parts of you. Like you have to let go of your true beliefs. And I I think he lies a lot. I think he doesn't believe in God. I think he's, you can't, we can't have you like this, Brett. (laughs) Brett, you're so distracted. I mean, it's kind of fun though. I mean, him being like tilted like that with the trippy picture in the background kind of gives this whole thing a Pomo quality so that's fun yeah it's like it's it's representative of of how how we actually do things here form imitates content right exactly hold on let me unmute him Mm -hmm. what are you fucking here we can't hear you what are you doing i am on my knees by the computer (laughs) we need your camera to be upright yeah (laughs) right now we kind of look like one of those visual puzzles they'll get kids to do it's like which one of these is not like the other okay Shit, shit, shit. Okay. So we were talking about how he he's pandered into his right-leaning audience. I don't think he really believes in God, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I think he uses God as an anti-Nietzschean pomo sword to kind of like mm-hmm. pretend like we can fight this like postmodern monster by believing in God. And also believing in God for him puts his house in order, so to speak. So constructing this belief in God, I think helps him to keep his own fucking sanity, but it's ultimately a lie. Hmm. Well, I'd like to say that there's a longstanding tradition of that within the reactionary tradition that he does fund very comfortably within. Nietzsche is actually a remarkable exception to that, which you can talk a little bit about if you want, but I'll give you just two examples at the origin of modern conservatism. One is Edmund Burke and reflections on the revolution in France. Now, Burke is usually taken to be a defender of ordered liberty conservatism or a more moderate kind of conservatism, and accurately so, right, I should say. But one of the most remarkable passages in the Reflections is where he talks about the need to ascribe sublime qualities to social institutions, and in particular, social hierarchies. And what's interesting is he never says that these sublime qualities actually need to be existent within the objects in itself or correspond to anything existent. He just says it's useful for us to think about them this way. Because if you believe that there's some kind of divine ordinance that specifies that society needs to be organized this way, you'll be less likely to disrupt it. And he's absolutely Mm. right about that, I should say. And this kind of takes a functionalist approach to religion uh, and to sublimity that really has a long-standing history, as I mentioned, within the conservative tradition. Now, a more extreme figure in this vein is Joseph de Maestra, who makes a very similar argument where he says that you need to approach political institutions the same way that you approach religious themes, as if they're dogmatic truths that are not to be questioned, certainly by the ordinary peasants of the world. And interestingly, Nemes says that enlightenment philosophy and reason is even a destructive force, precisely because it leads us to question whether these sublime qualities are actually attached to the monarchy, the church, or whatever it happens to be. But more than that, he says that once we recognize that there are sublime qualities that attach to social hierarchies and institutions, then we realize that we can participate in something bigger than ourselves by submitting to the monarchy. So it's not really submission in this kind of slavish sense. It allows you to participate in the glory that is the House of Bourbon or whatever, and its attempts to expand France all over the continent. Again, you really see echoes of that in, again, this functionalist approach to religion that Peterson takes, where he'll sometimes say things like, well, what else are you going to believe in if you don't believe in this? You know, God is a preserver or guarantor of order. If you were to take God out of the equation, people are just going to believe in nothing or nihilism. So it's useful for us to act as though God exists, even while we might not be able to prove that he does exist. Now, for me, that's a pretty crappy argument in a lot of ways, because we don't just want to say it's useful for us to have this belief. We want to say that there's actually something true that corresponds to this belief. The most honest conservative thinker in that day was a man called Leo Strauss, who in his natural right in history said, 
Look, you can argue all you want for the utility of a belief. And maybe it's true that we would believe in something like natural right and God. But just because a belief has a lot of utility doesn't make it true. Right? right. I would gain a lot of utility from believing that I'm going to live forever or that, you know, the universe is going to persist forever without succumbing to some kind of heat death. But neither of those things is likely true. You can't simultaneously profess to be concerned primarily about truth and, and that be your entire argument against one camp and then come up with your own delusion. And I think that's what he does. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing is, is that probably Zizek actually believes in God with a deeper meaning than oh, yeah. Peterson does. No, absolutely. And I mean, this is one of the things that a number of better Christian theologians have pointed out, and actually Nietzsche was aware of, right? Where Zizek's interpretation of the Judeo-Christian story, he actually engaged in a very interesting dialogue with an Orthodox theologian called John Milbank that people can check out called The Monstrosity of Christ. So Jesus characterizes himself as an atheist Christian uh, or a materialist Christian. There's a number of different labels he gives to himself. But he says, look, one way of understanding the story of Christianity is that God literally died on the cross. That's what that symbolized. And this is very much Hegel, right? And once God died on the cross, he gave to his most cherished creation, humanity, responsibility for existence. And we were then absolutely free to kind of recreate the world as we saw fit. Although that's not necessarily just a gift, it's also a burden because now we bear responsibility for whatever it is that we choose to create. And as anybody who's read any history books knows, we've chosen to create some pretty fucking horrible things in our times, <laughs> right? <laughs> and you know, Jesus' while. point is to say, you know, the story isn't literally true. You know, he says, I don't believe that God actually died on the cross, but it symbolizes a transition that was enacted by Christianity in our way of thinking about our place within the universe. Well, I think one of the things that, that I've, I've gotten from him over time that I think is quite meaningful is the difference between the literal and the metaphoric truth. I think that's mm -hmm. one of the fundamental things that goes on inside of maps of meaning. And yep. so there might be things that are actually true. And they may actually lead to nothing but uh, nihilism. We live in a special time, so everything is very well protected and we can think about all these abstractions above what it takes to survive. But a lot of the things that are embedded in religious traditions before, let's say, three or 400 years ago, really were there as, as a way to figure out how it was that we were going to best survive. And they're might have been something really meaningful in figuring out that there is a place for you that is above and beyond, you know, the short and harsh yeah. struggles of your life, the deaths of your children, your spouse in, in childbearing. So there may not be literal truths to these things, but functionally, until we came to this particular modern type of living afforded us by some of the backbone of religious things that maybe allowed us to get here, you couldn't really get yourself to separate some of your, your ideas from actual physical consequences. So you could lie to yourself a little bit in order to give yourself a sense of purpose in a way that maybe we don't have the need to now. And it might be a little easier to look back on those things and think about their primitivity and how, how wrong they must be. But there's still power in the metaphors that got us here. And I think that's why a majority of the world still clings to beliefs that maybe the three of us would say, yeah, maybe not so much. That ain't true. That might be a lot of bullshit. It's no more real than Scientology or some weird, you know, Buddhist cult out in the Midwest, let's say. But we are standing on the shoulders of giants in a lot of ways. Oh, absolutely. And I think this is something that Zizek affirms a lot in his own work, right? So hmm. there's a genealogy here that we can talk about in terms of the critique of fetishized idols that has roots itself within the Christian tradition. And this is something that Hegel and Zizek both bring up. And I think Peterson is cognizant of it in his own way as well. So I'll just give an example, right? In his lectures on religion, uh, Hegel says, look, the positive content of religion is obviously largely bogus, right? There is no God out there that's lording over us, a personalized deity. Nevertheless, where he differs from, say, the Richard Dawkins of the world is by saying, Religion is very clearly an important social phenomena. It's ubiquitous all over the world. So maybe we should interrogate what kind of meaning it has for people because it's intellectually interesting to do so. And one of the conclusions Hegel makes when it comes to analyzing the Christian faith, because it takes on other faith traditions, I should say, are pretty shitty, right? You know, it's the 19th century. They're pretty bigoted, racist, yeah. you know, all that stuff. But he says, look, think about this idea that you find in the book of Genesis, right? The book of Genesis, obviously, you know, Eve and Adam eat from 
the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And then what's interesting, he says, is this is often interpreted by unreflective Christians as a kind of story about the fall, right? This decline from paradise into the rough world of Hobbes, right? Making women a scapegoat as well. Oh, absolutely. And well, there's all kinds of feminists. That, that's actually right. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And there's all kinds of feminist criticisms you can make of this. But what Hegel says is really interesting is like, actually, if you read the Bible, God doesn't say, you're now shit, get out. He says, you are now actually like me in knowing good and evil. That's what's happened as a result of this fruit. So you can no longer live in this kind of infantile universe any longer where everything is just handed to you. You actually, again, have to go out and adopt a second order approach to your life where you're cognizant of your actions and are aware of the fact that you can bring good things or bad things into the world. And Hegel says, this is really a story then about moving towards self-consciousness. Now, it's not expressed in rationalistic terms in the way that we would understand it. And he obviously thinks that expressing it in rationalistic terms is better since it makes explicit what's only implicit within this metaphorically. But he says, you know, as a metaphor goes, it's obviously a very powerful one, right? And that's why it's lasted for a long period of time. And Hegel then goes on to say, what we gradually want to do in our society is move away from these kind of metaphorical or symbolic ways of thinking about the world to trying to address them more directly using the tools of reason, science, enlightenment, and so on. And I think that there's something very interesting to that project, right? Now, what Marx adds that complicates this picture that Zizek picks up on is Marx says, yes, we have moved towards a far more rational kind of world now, and we should be very grateful for that. But actually, in a lot of ways, we still ascribe magical qualities to all kinds of objects in our universe. And it's particularly objects that ascribe a certain social status to us, right? And this is the idea of commodity fetishism, where it says, if you think about why people like things like diamonds, for example, you know, diamond is just a hydrocarbon that's been put under a lot of pressure and it looks glittery and it's pretty, but people really lust after them because they figure that if I put this around me, individuals are going to respect me in a way that they don't now. And that's again, a kind of theological thinking. It's the same kind of mindset that people brought to pieces of the true cross when they figured, well, this will protect me from evil spirits because there's nothing about a diamond that makes you inherently a more worthy person. But Marx goes to say, they're not even necessarily wrong to believe that wearing diamonds will make them more respected because even though they are just rocks, people all around them will attribute certain kind of magical qualities to the rocks and therefore will attribute certain levels of status to the person who's wearing them. And there's this very complicated process of trying to rationalize our way of thinking about those kinds of things that you find in Marxism. One of those ways is to accept uh, Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And send four ninety nine to your local evangelical pastor every month, right? That's the most important <laughs> thing. So one of the things I, I would just say about the idea of the, the diamonds is that it's not just that you're elevated in terms of how others will perceive you for having had one, and because quite frankly, uh, they are kind of ubiquitous, at least in the West and at least in the uh, States. Hey, my, my wife said she wanted shiny things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, birthday, yeah right? Actually, so you know, I, I'm not saying I'm above this either. We all I, I, give into this. I, I've heard that, but but there's something also that that might be a little bit deeper. And I experienced this in my uh, particular uh, fetish. I'm about to reveal something to the world. I use the library like a fiend, and you know, pretty much my face should probably be on the damn thing. And what I usually will do is get the oldest copy of whatever it is I'm reading. And why is that? It's because it's been passed down through so many hands, so many That's other cool. minds have read it. And I, I try to imagine the history of the course of this thing, and now it's becoming a part of me, but it's also been a part of these others. And so when you think about a diamond, it's, its value, yes, is in part its dollars, but it's also because of what it took to get that thing. And so if you think about the history of where that came from, again, we get down to this narrative of of what is an object and how does it achieve its value and maybe its sublimity. And some of it has to do mm -hmm. with the, this historicity, the multiplicity of people that it's passed through. And that I think you can navigate or, or zig and zag like we, we got from Emerson way back when between these concepts and see the value in both of those perspectives. This is a perfect segue into what I was thinking because you said like the unthinking conservatives. I read your article on anti-intellectualism oh, yeah. and I love being a thinker where people are like, is she right? Is she left? Like that's where I like to be, but I lean a little bit left. And mm -hmm. so I often hold that same criticism and I, I like to criticize the left more because I'm closer to them and it's, sure. I don't know, reflective. I can see it a little bit more. So I think the left often likes to criticize the right for being unthinking. But what you were just saying about diamonds and, and books and the way that you 
find meaning in the historicity of the diamond, most people who value diamonds don't find that. They actually want to ignore where that diamond came from. Mm. They don't want to think of it as a fossil. They don't want to think of the hands in the Congo that it passed through. They, they want to like it for the functional truth that it exhibits. And I think a lot of times we consider that anti-intellectualism. Hmm. But I had this thought that intellectualism itself begets anti-intellectualism. Like hmm. we are critiquing this functional, superficial thought and we're kind of ascribing no depth to it. But then we then we want to go in and find all this other depth behind it. And it's and to me, it's it's painful to see us like kind of like pick at each other like that because we're both anti-intellectual in our own right. And I think the real value that we have now is the is the ability to rise above that and see where each argument has intellectual merit and not kind of criticize it. So like getting back to like this concept of mm existential intelligence. I, I really think this concept has more to do with finding depth in shallowness and kind of the unity of opposites and being able to just find something a little bit different than what we've been finding before. This And, and, the, and the debate was a perfect example of that, where I felt like they really did their best to find ways that we can come together. Absolutely. And I want to say, I agree with you. And I think that the difference between Brett's understanding of a book and appreciation for it because of that history and somebody's unthinking uh, appreciation for diamonds because they think that that will ascribe them a certain level of status, which they will, but you know, there's no criticism of society or recognition of where that's coming from, uh, is the level of self-consciousness that's brought to bear when it comes to contemplation of that object and an awareness precisely of that history and the materiality of that object. So I'll give you an example, and this is kind of my own definition of existential intelligence. So I'll just use this as an opportunity to kind of throw that out there. If you look at the kind of Western intellectual tradition, there are four concepts of freedom that have been operative within it, as I understand it. One is a conception of negative freedom that you find many classical liberals articulate, the idea that I'm a free and rational being so long as I am not interfered with directly by another or by an institution, right? The famous summary of this is, you know, People should be free to wave their fist where, until, you know, my nose begins. It's expression. The second kind of freedom that you see operative is usually a positive or substantial view of freedom, which holds that I am more free if I'm more capable of making certain kinds of choices. And the usual example given for this is, imagine I were to throw you on a desert island, right? Um, you know, nobody would be interfering with your negative freedom. And from a classical liberal standpoint, you might say, therefore, you know, I am absolutely free on this desert island. But most people would disagree with you because the only options you would have in your life are eating coconuts, climbing the mountain, or fishing. And we would get really, really tired of that really quickly. And you might even start to see the island as a prison, you know, kind of like Tom Hanks and Castaway or something. And rightly so, because you're not capable of making more meaningful kinds of choices, right? The third kind of concept of freedom that you see operative is social or Republican freedom. This idea that I should have an influence on the world around me and the politics that govern me. We won't get into that if, unless you want to. But the third concept of freedom that you see operating is self-conscious freedom, which is this ability to kind of take a second order distance towards the objects of my own thinking and to recognize the fact that any kind of qualities that they possess aren't intrinsic to the object themselves. They are ascribed to it by me and by the social world around us. Now, that doesn't mean that once you take a kind of self-conscious distance from the objects of your perception, that those qualities disappear. It just means that you can appreciate them in a certain different way. So for instance, I'm very critical of people on the left who fall in the Adornian tradition of just saying, anything that pop culture trace produces is just crap and you shouldn't enjoy it because you should only yeah. enjoy eccentric yeah, European people. art films, you know, in yeah. German or French. <laughs> now, I like those art films. <laughs> Plenty well, but they're good. <laughs> but I also like Marvel movies. I'm a big fan of those, yeah. right? And I'm kind of self-conscious of the fact that they're crap. You know what I mean? That's why we like them. Exactly, right? You know, I'm aware <laughs> that, you know, the end of every movie is just going to involve, you know, the villain trying to crash some big object into, you know, a city. And that's fine. It's spectacle. It's enjoyable. And if anything, it helps me kind of decompress from a lot of the kind of more heavy lifting stuff that I do. And I think that's why a lot of other people, especially the broad swath of people enjoy them. It's a way of kind of retreating from the world, which you all need to do at point. And there's nothing wrong with that as long as you're self-conscious about that and you don't subsist entirely on a diet of meaningless crap, right? But you know, it would be different if I wasn't self-conscious about this and I was just to sit there and say, 
Eh. Yeah, like the meme, mean. like the, the, the <laughs> meme with the head caved in. So you're saying that this this fourth type of freedom is is in your mind the self conscious freedom is like the ultimate existential intelligence. Is that it is right heard? because it's an awareness of the fact that. Any kind of sublime or aesthetic qualities that we see in existence aren't intrinsic to those objects themselves. They are things that cognition Our puts life. there and ultimately we put there. And this mm -hmm. gives a certain degree of freedom when it comes to deciding what values we like. And this is a point, again, that was very well articulated by Kant in his Critique of Judgment, all right, where he says, the difference between myself and Aristotle is when Aristotle looked at the universe, he says, I see divine purpose everywhere, and that purpose is actually latent within the objects itself. They're all trying to fulfill this telos, whether they know it or not, right? And Kant says, I think that nature in and of itself is unknowable to me, right? Maybe there's some higher purpose to it, maybe there's not, but we'll never know. However, that doesn't mean that I don't see purpose in the blooming of a flower, for example, and don't appreciate the beauty of that. But that's something that my mind puts there, right? It's not latent within the flower itself, which is just a complicated set of mechanical and biological processes instantiating themselves over time, right? But wouldn't you agree then that the true existential intelligence would then be the ability to say that there may be some intrinsic properties that are characteristic of that flower, and I also ascribe my own to it? Yeah, but that's there exactly is what I would say. Mm -hmm. Objective and subjective at the same fucking time. Yeah, th that's exactly what I would say. Now, things get a little bit more complicated, as I'm sure you know, when it comes to things like quantum theorizing, since, of course, it's a little bit more difficult to say where it is a comprehension of certain phenomena begins and where it is that physical phenomena begin, right? But right. for the most part, when it comes to the more macrological levels of reality that we perceive on an everyday basis, right, we can have a pretty good empirical understanding of the mechanics and physics of a large-scale object describe it relatively accurately using the tools of modern science. And when it comes to the qualities that we ascribe to it, I think that adopting a level of self-consciousness, realizing that we're the ones that are ascribing it to those objects, can allow us to do that with a higher degree of freedom and reason than what it was capable in the past. Where again, and this is the Hegelian point, people tended to actually ascribe or actually insist that these qualities were latent within objects themselves. And so they had mm -hmm. magical kinds of powers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we're getting in, uh, into a little bit more of like, uh, you know, the science meets philosophy, which I think is probably the place where I like to be the most. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it, you know, last night, thinking about kind of like where in the brain is existentialism. And <laughs> I was thinking about how, <laughs> how we've only had fMRI for fucking 30 years. You know, we've only had a way to view inside our domes and see what's going on for like as long as I've been alive. And so we don't really have a fucking clue what's going on when we have these feelings. And so like moving towards consciousness and moving towards understanding this like lived experience versus the physicality of it. It's like we're moving there, but we just fucking started down that path. And it's it's so exciting and wondrous to me. And I think a lot of the right is concerned that this lived experience, this, you know, kind of what you're calling existential intelligence, will somehow block that exploration from like the objective scientific perspective. Whereas I think it will enhance it inevitably. Yeah, I think so. I mean, my understanding of this is a little bit different, but I should just say, I completely agree with you. Uh, I mean, I'm not a philosopher of consciousness. Uh, my sister is in cognitive science and she's the one I go to for most of my, you know, information about this. And she would say exactly what you did, right? That the scientific study of consciousness or cognition or mind is at most 30 years old. This is, to put it mildly, a bit of a tricky problem, right? You know, what consciousness is. The hard problem, yeah. The yeah, hard problem of consciousness. Exactly. exactly. The hard problem of consciousness is, you know, Thomas would put it. And, you know, we're a long way from kind of settling it. And Maybe it's a good thing, right? Maybe we don't necessarily have to have all the answers. Certainly it's fun to speculate about it, but I'm willing to defer to the kind of best empirical evidence that will come forward in the future that will help explain how it is that electrical transmissions, you know, within neurons actually produce something like the phenomena of being myself, right? But in terms of the political rights response to this, I think again, the reason why this kind this concept of existential intelligence has been threatening to many of them, and by no means all, again, there are certain right-wing thinkers like Nietzsche, right? who really stress this for a variety of different reasons, is many conservative thinkers and many reactionary thinkers tend to insist again on 
the intrinsic sublimity of social hierarchies and social institutions as they exist in the moment. And they want to claim that there's a certain kind of natural or mythological necessity to those institutions as we find them. And taking a kind of second order existential stance towards them obviously problematizes that because then when we become aware that the institutions that govern us and the hierarchies that surround us are just human creations. Now they might have important functions to play. And I'm not saying we should just be critical of human institutions when we realize that they're just our creations. But it does open up conceptual space to say, well, if this is what we've done so far, maybe we could do things somewhat differently, right? Maybe there's an alternative that could be better, right? That's uh, progressivism, and, period, you know? Exactly, right? Yeah. And if you're a conservative and you want things to pretty much stay the same, that's not something you're going to be instinctively comfortable with. And again, there's a long history of more candid and honest reactionaries being transparent about this. Demetra is one of the most important, like I mentioned, he says that Enlightenment philosophy is fundamentally a destructive force, and he uses that term destructive because it puts social institutions forward for the criticism of every single person, and that's extremely problematic. But you don't even need to look back that far. Roger Scruton, who I think is the most brilliant conservative intellectual in the late 20th and early 20th, 21st century, wrote a book called The Meaning of Conservatism that has a remarkable passage in it that I quote in the piece you referred to where he says there's something really admirable about, and this is his phrase, unthinking people who bear the burdens of life with quiet dignity, and they don't seek to situate blame where they don't have the immediate prospect of recourse. And he goes on to say, look, these they kinds of unthinking be. people look at society as it is. <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly what these people do. They look at society. They say, it is what it is. I don't really need to have many complicated thoughts in it. My job is just to be the peon and do what I'm told. Well, here's the fundamental problem we have with, with discussions like this generally. And that is that, you know, we, we can sit back and, and discuss things at a level of abstraction that includes all of these ranges of possibility. But, mm -hmm. you know, the, the average person working the average job, doing the average things is maybe, you know, beset by things that won't allow them the opportunity or the time or the emotional distance from things because of whatever struggles they're going through and they're happening all the time as opposed to maybe I have a struggle here and there and I can weave in and out of it such that there will be a, a generalized, let's say it's not unthinking, but it is less existentially th thought out way of approaching the things that happen in the world. And I would even say that I agree with, with Scruton on one level, and that is, I remember having a conversation one time, and we were talking about being at like a, it might've been a concert or a party or something like that, and how, you know, some people uh, struggle to be able to turn off the intellectualization and the tendency to observe and all the other stuff that goes oh, on. Fuck yeah. uh and I say, I, I say, well, that's kind of fucked up because you are losing out on an experience that you are just rationalizing about by not allowing yourself to turn off the intellect and be subsumed in an experience that actually tells you something about the world. So I think it's good to be able to do these things and it's a nice, you know, trick of the intellect for like the three of us to have this conversation, but there's also something missing in the beauty of experience by always filtering through these, this overweening intellect. Oh yeah, I would absolutely agree with that. I mean, I struggle with the same kind of difficulties, right? And I think it is important sometimes to not adopt a kind of second order level of self-consciousness towards phenomena, because if you're doing that, then you miss out on the qualia of the experience, to use a term from the kind of philosophy of mind. And, you know, concert's a really good example, right? If you're sitting there thinking, you know, these lyrics are kind of dumb, or, you know, this group isn't exactly high art or something, then you're never going to be able to fucking appreciate, you know, Muse or Oasis or a lot of the bands that I like, right? Because part of the whole experience is, you get there, you have a couple of drinks, and you've fucking become a fan. You become part of, right. you know, the LCD yeah. sound system army, you know, of which I'm a card-carrying member, <laughs> yeah. and you just enjoy it, right? And I think that that's something that certainly academics and artists and intellectuals can broadly struggle with and don't always appreciate. But I think that I would argue that in terms of the political implications of this, the reason why it is that the left tends to foreground existential or self-conscious intelligence is because a lot of times the problems that people are facing, which are very practical problems, cannot be solved unless you think through them at a social level. And I'll give you an example going back to Dr. Peterson, right? You know, in 12 Rules for Life, he has this famous passage where he says, 
if things are going crap bad at your job, you know, don't complain. It's not the fault of capitalism. It's not the fault of the feminists. It's not the fault of postmodern neo-Marxists. Try to focus on daily improvements for yourself. And, you know, who knows, maybe down the line, they'll get a promotion and things will be going a bit better. Now, I'm not saying that's not good advice, right? In a lot of contexts, you know, you should work hard and you should hope that you get that promotion. And if you can find a little joy, you know, working at McDonald's, like I sometimes did, then good, you know, but there are is a sense in which people's lives, including people in those circumstances, would be very tangibly improved by improving working conditions uh, at McDonald's, yeah. right? Making sure that you don't have to fucking go out into a dumpster in the middle of the summer uh, where there's a whole bunch of rats eating at the food because there are safety regulations and laws against that, right? And these are all political steps that you can take that would make these people's lives materially better. And that's precisely the kind of thing that he's saying you shouldn't be thinking about. Just focus on yourself. And I don't think these are all that complicated in terms of the steps that they could be taken to make these people's lives a little bit better. It just requires a recognition of the fact that a lot of the problems that impact us are shared problems, right? We're not going to resolve them ourselves, and we need to cooperate in order to try to create a better world for ourselves and our great-grandchildren. Uh, now, obviously, the example of you know working at McDix is a pretty simple one, and I think there are fairly <laughs> simple steps. But I think that these scale upward more transparently than a lot mm -hmm. of these folks like to acknowledge, right? I mean, yeah. think about something like the model of economic organization that I put forward. I don't really think there's any denying anymore that the Nordic social democracies, for example, are far and away the most successful human societies we've invented thus far. Now they have their problems. There's not utopias. There's never going to be a utopia, right? But certainly almost everybody would rather live in Sweden than Singapore, unless they were exceedingly rich. So why not try to draw lessons from that and try to emulate that over here? What's so particular and so special about the way that things are being done here, if we could make them better? in ways that other human societies with, in many ways, far fewer resources have actually already been able to achieve. Well, one of the Sorry. things reverting to the debate where he brings up the uh, example of, of China basically grabbing the free market approach and then yeah. bringing in also, unfortunately, this crushing authoritarianism that really yeah. needs to ultimately become something like the kind of socialistic things you see in those, those Nordic countries. And, you know, we do some socialism here. But we sure as hell don't do enough. And we could yeah. certainly do quite a bit better. And I think they both arrived at, and I think Peterson seems to walk in looking to just smash on on Marxism and the idea of communism and socialism and, and so forth. But even he says, I'm not looking for this to be unfettered. There need to be checks and controls and the best systems do just that. The thing that we fail at the most in the States really is how to make sure that the least fortunate among us have something that looks like a reasonable living condition because our poor are not in good shape. The people who don't have access to mental health are not in good shape. And I, I have arguments with people where I say we have more access than we think we do, but the ability to get that access requires a kind of expertise in navigating systems that those people also don't necessarily have. I think, you know, what he did in that, in that argument, like they talked about China and I think they also talked about North Korea and this concept yeah. of kind of all the best countries. Yeah. 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 <laughs> all the best. Yeah, countries. Like, you know, huge, Nick says, like, huge. they're huge. Like Trump. Yeah, he says like, oh, try and take, try and yeah. put your house in order in North Korea. And I think this is a perfect example of the one place where they disagreed pretty much where they're talking about collective action versus personal action. And Peterson's belief is that if you do enough of that, it'll lead to collective action. Whereas Zizek believes that we all have to kind of collectivize first or prioritize that. And I think balance between these two is what's important. Right. But more than that, I think the way that they dipped into these points of disagreement is a perfect model for, I think, the way that we should be approaching things in general. Because what you see in the world when you look at topics like this and discussions and polemics is pure disagreement. They like focus in on that disagreement and fuck all the parts of agreement. And I think in order to have productive conversations, we have to mostly agree and then work out some of the parts where we don't agree. It obviously takes both. So you know, you ought to be making sure your life is well organized and you also oh, yeah. ought to be to looking at, if you're not at least doing that and all you're doing is complaining about the rest of the world, you're missing something fundamental for your ability to control and regulate your own stuff. That being said, 
if everything around you is collapsing and they are a large component of the reason that the things inside your home are not organized and are therefore maybe even unorganizable, doing nothing about that leaves you in a kind of, as a kind of flotsam and, and a slave. So you need to do both. You need to be personally responsible. And maybe you also need to be socially responsible. And both of those positions are, I would say, they're at least equally valid or it requires both of them in order to be able to achieve something like a better society. And even Peterson recently has said something about the masculine and feminine kind of ethos. Mm -hmm. And he talks about something, and this might be worth exploring and I'm not sure where, about how he thinks something about the, the feminine is not necessarily scalable. Like there are aspects of things that you can do at home that are specifically more feminine than masculine in his conception. And those things don't necessarily scale up to to society. And so even within his own oeuvre, he's basically saying something like, you can do things at home, but they aren't necessarily going to scale. So he's already starting to tear apart even some of his own edicts by saying, look, the house there are aspects of this that are that are microcosmic, but like many things, when you scale them up, they begin to dissolve and lose their utility and might actually have you know, antithetical effects. Hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, look, this is a very complicated point, so I'll try to be as brief as I can. A lot of people have criticized the left and the French Revolution and socialism in particular for its fraternalistic aspiration, you know, this idea that you would have a world where everyone treats one another as brothers and sisters, which again has a kind of Christian connotation to it, right? And we all love one another and care for one another like you would a family. I don't think that that's ever a realistic aspiration because I think St. Augustine is right that it is purely a matter of happenstance that I belong to this family or I have this set of friends, or I grew up in this town, but it's an eradicable that those kinds of instances of happenstance are going to shape our emotional outlook. Now, where I disagree with critics of this paternalistic ethos is in their interpretation of how much we need to seed on that basis. Because it's one thing to sit there and say, oh, we're never going to have a world where we're going to treat each other as brothers. It's another thing to say that we can't have a world where we treat each other as equals who merit a certain level of respect or at least decent treatment, right? And I think that is very much an achievable goal. And I think, Qua, your earlier comment that that is definitely not what we have right now, where there are billions of people in the world who we do not treat with a great deal of respect and who certainly we don't treat with any kind of decency, certainly not in the way that we'd want to be treated. And the second thing that I want to bring up on that is that there's this kind of dichotomy that is sometimes drawn between taking charge of your own life and engaging in social justice or political activism. Now, I do think that there is a dichotomy, but it's a more blurred one than we usually appreciate because you know, I've met people who are certainly defined by their resentments, right? Mm. Where almost any kind of problem that they have in their life is externalized on some kind of persecutor. They are superficially political in the sense that sometimes they appeal to this victim rhetoric about anything, but ultimately, you know, if all you are is defined by your resentments, you're not going to be able to achieve very much either for yourself or for the people around you, right? But there is another kind of person that I've encountered who would have been very familiar to somebody like Aristotle, for example, who sees contributing to their society and working to make their community a better place as part of a process of individuation for them. And I think that there's some truth to what the Taoists used to say, which is that even if you do have a personal problem, sometimes helping someone out with their problem can mm. be the first step towards you resolving yours, mm. right? And again, this is ancient wisdom, which oddly enough, somebody like Peterson should be very aware of, right? That's never really he captured. That. He does that in his better moments, right? And uh, it's just not really captured in this hyper-individualist ethos that's sometimes put forward, which is that there's this distinction between looking after myself and looking after others. But that's the irony of what I was saying that he does. <laughs> in the reason why he leaned into the right, I think, is because he believes that in helping these people, he will be perpetuating his own individual oh, yeah. action. So that's what I think, and the reason why I think he leans so hard. I mean, obviously, also, it makes his life a little bit easier, too, I think. But, no. but part of... I Millions think of dollars never hurt, right? <laughs> no, but I think it's also like he needed to secure his future in a sense so that if he collapses again, he can, you know, continue on and, you know, provide for his family and whatnot. It's fuck you money is basically what I'm thinking Peterson <laughs> needed to lean into is yeah. to say, I need to be able to protect myself from, from how difficult this job is because whether you agree with him or not, being a public intellectual today is like, Jesus Christ, like, fuck. Like, it sounds... Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, I, I don't even like getting 50 emails from my students during the exam period. I can only imagine what it must be like if I got fucking, like, 10,000 messages a day from people. 
I'd freak out. Yeah, and if they were also very often very heavily critical and, and, and demonizing, and then you're trying to they're fend off you. the emotional problems that come along with that because you're only so resilient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The threshold as well, like you talked about the misery threshold, which I thought was an interesting, I do like Peterson's take on psychometrics a lot of times because he said, you know, how Well, that's where his expertise is and he's good at it, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. But he's right about like, you know, money helps you to not be miserable. And then to a certain point, it does not increase happiness. And I, right. I see this a lot of times with a lot of different like psychometrics, we ascribe them to be face value. So I think that's a place where I wish he would get back to. And I think he could have a lot of impact in kind of like, I don't want to say educating the right, but that's kind of what I mean. Like if he could do more of that, Peterson, if you ever see this, like, <laughs> do that, you know, that, that would be cool because I think that lifts everybody and it helps everybody. And I, I want to be um, respectful of your time. So I want to make sure that if there's anything else we need to like, kind of like get out. <laughs> that we, we recognize we're coming to a close. So I'm trying to think about how to round this out because we haven't been particularly funny in this episode. Like Brett took up all the funny energy in the beginning. We're way too serious. I have, I have to slip some more jokes well, in there. Well, you know, the sad thing is, you know, sitting there being like, let's talk about existential intelligence. It's kind of hard to sit there and be like, you know, existence, that's just a big joke, right? Unless you want to be like the Joker or something. I mean, that would be full nihilist. You know, we could go there like, it's all just a big laugh. Who cares? No, you know? no. We're absurdists. Like, we're absurdists, yeah. It, we're absurdists because it is a big joke and that's funny. And it's not sad. It's it's wonderful. I think there are a couple things, though. It's like th there needs to be a balance, again, of some. And there needs to be some things where you take gravely seriously because the consequences of not doing so, like Peterson would say, are also dire. Right. So, you know, being able to bring some levity actually also supports the ability to handle the most difficult, let's say, crosses in a Judeo-Christian way that might come your way. And I think that's one of the things we do with our show is we take some serious stuff and we we goof around in ways that are, yeah. I, I think, Offensive. helpful. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, this is a real nerd reference, but I'll just roll with it, right? Because I was writing about this just a few days ago. Somebody pointed out to me once that Heidegger was a philosopher without a sense of humor par excellence, right? He is just a fucking relentlessly humorless guy who takes himself really, really seriously. And I sometimes do wonder if he could actually laugh, especially at himself. If he would have decided to have been A, a better person and B, to have had some better politics. Because there's something about this ability to laugh at the world and definitely at yourself that kind of inoculates you, I guess, against mm -hmm. megalomania. Because you realize that you're not the hottest shit in the world, that you fuck up like a lot of other people do. And maybe not every word that comes out of your mouth is, you know, the voice of God, you know, speaking from the high heavens. And right. I think it's a healthy you, thing to have. Are you the one who posted the joke about Trump in the Oval Office on Twitter recently? Probably. I mean, I have a slot on that. Okay, so no, I basically, somebody asked Trump, like, you know, you know why they call it the Oval Office? He's like, there are no corners in there. And he was like, yeah, there's nowhere to hide. And Trump looks around and goes, yeah, there's no one in here. Like, don't, don't, don't worry about it. There's no one in here. Like, they couldn't hide if they wanted to. And he's like, no, no. So you can't hide. <laughs> Trump's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. I, well, of course, you know, but he like, you know, speaking of megalomaniacs, but you're absolutely right. Like Trump, I would love to see Trump laugh at himself. Like that would show, that would give me hope for the worst of humanity. Yeah. No, no. His, his sarcasm is, is, uh, well, it, it's often pretty damn funny if you listen to it with the right. Oh ear. yeah. Uh, but, yeah, but, but he he's does not laughing at himself. Way like, too, way I, I know radical serious. leftists who will admit in moments of weakness, usually after a couple of drinks, that even they found some of Trump's tweets funny. Like the one they just like sent out a few years ago, like, Merry Christmas to all the losers and haters of the radical left. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. It's like, I was like, I watched, read that, and I did laugh out loud. I'm like, I don't know whether he was intending to be funny or whether this is just so tone deaf that it is funny, but my God, is it fucking hilarious, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. the same thing with the Andrew Tate and Greta. Like, it's, and you did post that. I know you did. That's that I did. Yeah, hilarious. that was amazing. The box is hysterical. <laughs> They're fucking caricatures. Like, yeah. And this, these are prominent figures that almost everybody who is terminally online knows. And some people are like very adamantly in support of one or the other. And you, if you have a fucking brain in your head, you just have to go, these people are both fucking insane. They're, yeah, they're, they're both a little crazy. Oh, yeah. I, and I was like, look, if you're trying to convince people that you don't have small dick energy, maybe don't respond to it with like a giant cigar in your mouth. <laughs> being like, I absolutely don't have small dick energy. I got like the biggest dick energy. Like everybody's internalized enough. Freudian psychoanalysis to know what the fuck that means, right? Yeah. So I wanted to slip slip something in there. 
<laughs> Thinking of dick energy. It's, the idea of existential intelligence is to, to say something like, there are layers and layers of, of potential existence in almost every situation. And when you think about things socially, maybe among the most important things is to just know where, where it is that you can do the most good or facilitate the best things for the people to the degree that you understand them. And then to be able to just absorb that role without thinking about it too much and reveling in your, let's say, sacrifice in a way that uh, Zizek was mentioning, like, hey, you can become almost addicted to this idea that your suffering is magnificent and you're acknowledging it and so forth. And so you need to be able to just toggle almost like when we were talking about verbal intelligence between different levels and meet the situation where it is and just be. And if you can do that, then maybe that's the best thing you can hope for. I think that's good. Work of yeah. wisdom from Brett. <laughs> <laughs> Put that in a Hallmark card, right? Yeah, Toggle yeah. between different levels. <laughs> Happy Valentine's. <laughs> and cut. That was it. Thanks so much for listening. For more resources, including show notes, bonus content, and behind the scenes footage, make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter at theoryyang.io forward slash newsletter.